All right, good morning. If you would, get out your Bibles and open up to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, we'd like to welcome those of you that are joining us right now on our live stream. We appreciate you tuning in as well as anybody who may be watching this after the fact. I'm going to say this real quick just for the benefit of people who are in the live audience and some of you. We have nothing to do with how many commercials YouTube is playing. Okay, we're not monetized. The church is not collecting money from our YouTube ministry. It is solely a YouTube thing. If there's somebody either in-house or in Cyberland that knows how to get it to stop, I would love to know about it. But I know that there are people that YouTube is incessantly interrupting uh, those who watch after the fact with commercials like every 10 minutes. There's nothing, I, I don't know what to do about it. If somebody knows how to fix it or get it to stop, let me know. I'm sure there is if we, like, pay them money. They'll hold us ransom and then, you know, uh, let us air without commercials. But if you know about it, let me know. I'd like to have a conversation about that uh, and how it might be able to be fixed. So we're going to continue this morning with our series of studies in the book of Galatians. And we find ourselves right now in the passage here in Galatians chapter 5 where Paul is talking about the works of the flesh. Now, this is part 7, and I'm spending time on this because... We need to know from the Word of God and be able to identify through the objective standard of God's Word, not our own private hunches and opinions and impressions, what the works of the flesh are. The Scriptures tell us what they are. They enumerate a list here for us, and we need to make sure that we... Un- there we go. That's the Prince of Power there, right there. Um, what Mark... Uh, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Lord, thanks again for this t- day and for this time and for this opportunity that we have to open up your word. Lord, we pray as we do that we'll have clarity and understanding as we talk about an issue that might be somewhat controversial, um, the issue of drunkenness this morning, that we can uh, have clarity from your word about this subject matter. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As we work our way down here, guys, we find ourselves in verse 21 with the issue of drunkenness. If you read the verse, it says, envyings, murders, drunkenness. The next thing in the list of the works of the flesh is the issue of drunkenness. Now, let me say a couple things. I am aware of the fact that we have all different kinds of people here in the audience, in person, and both online, that have all different kinds of history in their families, in their past, in their personal history, potentially with the issue of alcohol and alcoholism and these issues, okay? I myself have a member of my family that has almost died on more than one occasion because of an overdose related to consuming too much alcohol. Uh, They were on a transplant list because they needed a new liver. They were basically drinking themselves to death. So I understand that this can be somewhat of an emotional topic. I know there are some members of the assembly that have a, hit, a past with the issue of alcohol, that have, that have struggled with this, that have wrestled with this, and, and, and uh, probably could, could tell you more um, personal experiences than I can. Alcoholism, just to be up front, drinking, as, as it were, is not something that I have had much, uh, not something I've struggled with much in my life. I've just not been interested. Um, that doesn't make me holier or better than anyone else. It's just me being honest with you about it, that it's, it hasn't been something that I've engaged in um, in my life. Now, uh, other things in the list, you know, you want to start talking about hatred and some of the other stuff? Yeah, you know, we can talk about those things as it relates to me. We've been saying as we've gone through here that each one of these is going to land a little bit different with every one of us, okay? So let's start talking then about drunkenness. Drunkenness is explicitly mentioned under inspiration of God the Holy Spirit by the Apostle Paul in a list as a work of the flesh. It is expressly and explicitly identified here as a work of the flesh. 
So we need to look at this issue and see what the Word of God has to say. And let me say to you out front, there is a lot, the Bible has a lot to say about the issue of drunkenness, about the issue of alcohol, about the overconsumption thereof, the ramifications, and all sorts of things. The Bible has a lot to say about this particular topic. And so uh, we're going to try our best to kind of summarize a lot of that information. The word here that is translated drunkenness in verse 21, the Greek word that is translated drunkenness, is related in definition to the idea of intoxication. All right? So drunkenness and intoxication go together in your understanding. And the word, the specific word that is translated drunkenness here, only occurs three times in the New Testament. Hold your hand there in Galatians 5 and come back with me to Luke 21. Come back with me to Luke chapter 21. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about this specific word that is translated drunkenness here, and I want to show you that it is a couple other places in the New Testament. Now, don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean the New Testament doesn't say anything else about drunkenness. It just means that that word that is translated drunkenness only appears three times, okay? Luke 21 Luke chapter 21, look at verse um, 34. Luke 21, 34. He says, uh, take, heed, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Notice he's talking about being, he said, your hearts be overcharged, and he says, number one with suffering, number two with drunkenness, and number three with the cares of this life. That, to me, is an interesting statement, okay? Those of you who have experienced the issues uh, maybe in your past related to alcohol, suffering and the cares of life are very often related to the overconsumption of alcohol. In fact, one of the ways people try to deal with the cares of life and suffering that comes with it is through self-medication using alcohol. The scriptures are talking something about that. Come to Romans 13. Come over to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. You'll, met, you'll see another mention of drunkenness here. Look at Romans chapter 13. You better do like some finger burpees this morning and warm your hands up because we're going to be running a lot of verses today, okay? Romans 13, verse 13, let us walk honestly, Paul says, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. So notice that he, we are not to walk, our conduct, our walk, our course of life as believers is not to be done on the basis of those things. It's not in rioting. It's not in drunkenness. It's not in chambering, which is sexual immorality and wantonness. It's not in strife and envying. So three times the New Testament uses the word here associated with drunkenness in Galatians chapter 5. Turn back to Galatians chapter 5 with me if you would. And I want to look next at some definitions out of Noah Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language of the English word drunkenness, okay? There are three definitions that are given for drunkenness in the dictionary. The first one is this, intoxication inebriation, a state in which a person is overwhelmed or overpowered. I think those are two key words, overwhelmed or overpowered with spiritous liquors so that his reason is disordered and he feel and he reels or staggers in walking. Okay? So in other words, a, it's talking about a situation where somebody no longer has the normal operation of their faculties because they are overtaken by what? By alcohol. Okay? So again, that's intoxication and inebriation in a state, a state in which a person is overwhelmed or overpowered with spiritus liquor so that his reason is disordered and he reels or staggers in walking. Second definition. Drunkenness renders some persons stupid. Others gay or happy, so this is an old, that's what gay meant, okay, until that word has been co-opted by modern culture. So drunkenness renders some persons stupid, others gay, others sullen, others furious. 
So it's interesting that the dictionary is acknowledging that drunkenness manifests itself in different people in different ways, okay? And isn't that, you know, in the, in the culture of drinking, isn't that like what people, well, how do you hold your liquor kind of stuff, right? Well, the dictionary is acknowledging that there's different ways that people do that. Stupid, gay, sullen, or furious. And then the third thing it says is, disorder of faculties resembling intoxication by liquors, inf- inf- inflammation, and frenzied rage. Okay? So those are, what, those are some things there about um, that issue. Come over to Deuteronomy chapter 32. So drunkenness is related to intoxication. It's related to being under the influence of spiritus liquors, according to what the, di- the dictionary says. Now, the Bible, uh, Deuteronomy 32, the Bible has a lot to say about the issue of drunkenness, all right? So you can do searches. What I did is I went to Blue Letter Bible, and I typed in the word drunk, and then I put an asterisk in the search, and I hit enter. What that does for you is it pulls all of the words and all of the forms from the Bible in which the word drunk occurs. So it will pull drunkard, drunkenness, any derivative of, or any form of the word drunk, it will pull if you run that search, okay? The, a form of the word drunk occurs 81 times in 77 verses in the Bible, okay? Now, you got to be careful because not every occurrence of the word drunk is related to being intoxicated, okay? There are other symbolic uses of the word drunk that the scriptures will employ. Look at, look at just one of them, Deuteronomy 32. Look at Deuteronomy 32 and look with me at verse 42. Deuteronomy 32, um, start at verse 40. He says, for I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and I will reward them that hate me. Look at verse 42. And I will make mine arrows drunk with what? Blood. Now, in that use, drunk is not referring to being intoxicated. It's being used as a figure of speech for for bloodshed and blood being spilled in battle and in judgment, right? So if their arrows are drunk with blood, what does it mean? It means that they have been, they have hit their mark, they have found their mark, and have they been very effective in in rendering the enemy dead or ineffective for battle, okay? So to be drunk with arrow, to to be drunk with the blood of arrows is not the same thing in usage as somebody being intoxicated. So why am I pointing that out? You have to be careful when you run a search for drunk because it doesn't always mean intoxicated. The Bible does use this word in other ways, okay? Okay. So it's a figure of speech in this context for judgment and military conquest. Now, other occurrences of drunk, though, are in fact related to intoxication. Come back with me to Genesis chapter 9. The first such occurrence is in Genesis chapter 9. Okay, the first such occurrence is in Genesis chapter 9. Now, this passage about Noah has been used to say a lot of dumb things in the past. Um, I'm just going to read it, and we're just going to make some observations, and then I'll say a few brief things about it. Look at verse 20, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Notice, Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. So this is after the flood. Noah is now going to uh, engage in horticulture, and he's going to plant a, he's, he plants a vineyard. He's a husbandman now. Notice, and he drank the wine... And was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, look it. I don't think I need to get into great detail about what that means, but I take that to mean that Noah drinks himself into a stupor, and he's laying naked, exposed in his what? In his tent. Verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers without. So, does one of them witness their father's nakedness? And instead of covering him up, instead of being discreet, what does he do? He goes and tells the other two, right? And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon, um, and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's what? Now here's the point there, okay? Does Noah, is Noah clearly intoxicated? 
Does it cause him to act and to function in a way that is indecent and that therefore later on has the ability to compromise his sons? Okay, so people disagree about what exactly is going on here with Noah, but it's clear that Noah's drunkenness left him in a compromised position and his sons witnessed this, okay? Go to Job chapter 12. We're going to run some verses. Go to Job chapter 12. Looking at forms here in the scriptures of drunk as it relates to intoxicated. Job chapter 12. Look at verse uh, 25. Job chapter 12, verse 25. Um, if you go up to verse 24, he taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. Notice, they grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like what? So he's talking about people operating with no direction, and in op- these people that operate in no direction, one of the figures of speech that he uses, one of the similes is he compares them He maketh them to stagger like a drunken man, okay? So, back to your high school English class, what is the definition of a simile? I know you all know this. A simile is a comparison between two things using the words like or as, right? So he says there at the end of verse 25, he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. So he's using a drunk man to illustrate somebody who is staggering around without any what? Without any direction. Go to Psalm 107. I tried to keep these in order as best I could so that we could just sort of turn to them in their canonical order or the order which they appear in the scripture. Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Here again is a figurative use, okay, talking about judgment. If you look at verse 26. They mount up to heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. Look at verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits, what? End. So if you are reading a verse like that, is that verse painting drunkenness in a positive light or a negative light? It's it's very negative. Go to Proverbs 23. Come over to Proverbs chapter 23. Verse 21, Proverbs chapter 23, look at verse 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to what? Poverty. You know, it's not cheap economically to be involved in consumption of alcohol. It's very expensive, right? This is why the government puts taxes on things, right? They call these sin taxes, Cigarettes, alcohol, right? And part of the reason they do that is to try to prohibit people wanting to buy them, right? And they're happy to take the money too, by the way. But uh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. So there's, is there going to be an economic cost to being involved in drunkenness? Okay? It will impact you in your financial ability. To, you have to buy it, and the after effects can imp- impact your ability to work. Okay, you guys are familiar, I'm I'm assuming, with the uh, prohibition movement that led to the banning of alcohol in the United States. Okay, it didn't work out so well, but there were good reasons why at at the time people wanted to ban through prohibition alcohol. And one of the reasons were what some of the reasons, excuse me, were there were high instances of spousal abuse, child abuse. People showing up to work drunk and intoxicated, getting injured and maimed on the job because they were, you know, um, not, of, not of sound mind and, and they didn't have all their faculties and so they were being injured. And so the thinking on some people's mindset back in the uh, early 20th century was, well, the way you rectify this is you just take away what? Take away the alcohol, right? Make it illegal for, for, the, for alcohol to be, you know, produced and distributed and, and sold, Right? Well, the problem with that is you, 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 you never always, you're never able to mitigate against all the negative externalities that are going to result from that, right? So did people just stop drinking? 
No, it all went underground, right? And now you have the emergence of organized crime and Al Capone and all this stuff now because people didn't stop drinking. They just went underground with it, and now that created a whole bunch of other problems that didn't exist before they banned it, right? The biggest problem from alcohol, the biggest problem from prohibition was the advent of NASCAR. You know that's where NASCAR came from, don't you? The rum runners in the south, the moonshiners in the south souped up their cars to outrun the cops, and that's where we got NASCAR from. But anyway, you didn't come here for a history lesson. Go to Proverbs 26. Go to Proverbs 26. If you're a NASCAR fan, I apologize. Proverbs 26, look at verse 9. A thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard as a parable in the mouth of fools. So, the, 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 the author of the proverb is saying, if you mess with this, are you going to get stuck? It's not going to be good, is the ramification there. Now, drunkenness is also used as a metaphor of God's wrath. Quickly come to Isaiah 24. Quickly come over to Isaiah 24. So notice that all the verses we've looked at in this section of the message They've all had a form of the word drunk in them, all right? Isaiah 24, verse 20. This is talking about the day of the Lord and what's going to happen. If you look at verse 19, Isaiah 24, verse 19, the earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth has moved exceedingly. Now watch verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a what? He's talking about the physical planet. The planet that we are on right now, planet Earth, is there going to come a day when God deals with this planet in judgment. And when he deals with it in judgment, one of the metaphors he uses is that it's going to rock to and fro like a what? Like a drunkard. Verse 20, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it, sh and it shall come to pass that in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings that are upon the earth. So in that context is the word drunk used to depict the judgment of God. So I'm showing you a sampling here of the biblical usages of this word. Come to Acts 2. You know the story of Acts chapter 2. The apostles are in the upper room. The Holy Spirit comes down upon them, causing them to speak in other tongues. And what do some of the witnesses of this say? Look with me at Acts 2 verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem... Be this note unto you, and hearken to my words, that these are not, what, drunken as ye suppose. So the people that were there witnessing this miraculous occurrence of the Holy Spirit coming upon these men and them speaking in other tongues, languages that they had not studied, thought they were what? Thought they were drunk. Because to them, were they just slurring and making audible noises that were non-discernible to them because they didn't understand those languages. Okay, So outwardly, it appeared as if they were acting like drunk men. Come to 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians 5, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Paul says here to the Corinthians, But now I have written unto you not to, not to keep company, if any man that is a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a what? Drunkard. Drunkard. It's pretty clear in that verse, as Paul instructing the Corinthians, not to company with drunkards. Okay, so get mad at Paul. Don't get mad at me if you don't like what that verse says. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Very similar statement to what we have over there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, which is our text verse. Come over to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm almost done with this segment. Come over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul says, And be not drunk with what? Wine. Wherein is what? Excess. So you understand, is that verse saying that you're never to touch wine? That verse is saying you are not to consume wine to what? The excess. Now don't misunderstand me. Therefore, I am not saying that you should all have wine. I'm saying whatever you do with wine, you should not do it to what? Excess. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but contrast, be filled with the Spirit. That's a very important verse because that verse is saying that just, there's a, just as the alcohol controls the person that is drunk to excess, the believer is to be controlled by and live by and be motivated by God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Just a couple more here, 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm not saying we're not looking at more verses, but just a couple more in this section. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul's talking about some things related to the end times. Notice what he says here. It's an interesting way that he puts this. He says, for they that sleep, sleep when? In the night, and they that be drunken are drunken when? Even if you watch like TV and movies, um, they portray things that people who have too much alcohol too early, that there's somehow something wrong with them. Right? Like, if you're drinking alcohol in a show before 9 o'clock in the morning, like, they'll say there's, there's, there's high implications that that person has a bigger problem than, the, than somebody that doesn't do that till 9 o'clock p.m. You follow what I'm saying? Like, no, it, the verse says, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that drunk are drunk when? So where does the culture get the idea that drunkenness early in the morning is somehow bad? I would submit to you they're getting it from where? The Bible, whether they realize it or not, okay? And then last, Revelation 17, trying to go at a reasonable pace through this relatively quickly, but not so fast that we can't follow here. Revelation 17 is, again, an apocalyptic passage about something that's going to happen in the future. But notice verse 2, Revelation 17, verse 2, well, we'll get verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her what? So here, drunkenness is used to depict your spiritual debauchery. Okay, spiritual wickedness. So go back to Galatians chapter 5 briefly. So that is a quick, again, let me repeat this, okay? We just went through a series of verses. Remember that a form of the word drunk occurs 81 times in 77 verses. Not all of them are related to intoxication. Most of them are, but the word can be used in a variety of different contexts, okay? Okay. But the Bible, you're in Galatians 5, right? Read it again. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness. Drunkenness is one of these works of the flesh. But there's more in the Bible about drunkenness than just passages that use the word drunk or a form of the word drunk. Okay? Let's look at a few. Some of these we'll look at, we'll turn to. Others of them, I'll tell you the references if you're taking notes, because we're not going to have time to read all of these, okay? But I do want you to go to Genesis 19. Now, as you turn to Genesis 19, I want you to think about that occurrence we read about Noah. Noah is drunk in his tent. He lays there, according to the verses, completely naked, and does he compromise his sons as a result? Okay? Okay? So the point there is, does the drunkenness lead to now another immoral activity or another sinful activity? And the reason you would expect that is because by definition, a drunkenness and intoxication are related to somebody no longer having control over their own what? Their own faculties, right? Their own reasoning ability, control of their own body. So if they don't have control anymore because they're under the influence then is there a higher propensity that more bad decisions are going to follow the drunkenness? 
okay? Genesis 17, there's a situation here with Lot. Where did I tell you to go? I'm sorry, 19, Genesis 19. You were right, I was wrong. Genesis 19, verse 30. And, and Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in a mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in a cave and his two daughters. So it's Lot living with who? His daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Now, do I need to get real graphic and explain to you what that means? I don't think I do. I think you get the point, right? Verse 33, And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she what? Do these girls get their dad drunk and end up having a sexual relationship with their father? And that is carried out by the willfulness of the, and the use of alcohol to get him what? Drunk so that he doesn't perceive and know what is going on. So, boy, I'll tell you what, you don't need a more graphic example than that, right? Can, can crazy stuff Really nasty stuff happen when people are no longer in control of their own faculties. The Bible says the answer is what? Yes. Now, you can read the rest of it. It gets worse. We're not, we'll stop there. But if you want to read the rest of it, read down to the end of verse 38 sometime. Okay? We'll write this one down. Write down Leviticus chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. God commanded the priest, the priesthood in Israel, not to drink. They were not allowed to drink wine. They were commanded not to drink so that they could tell the difference between the holy and the unholy in Israel. Were the priests to serve as the judges over the nation of Israel? And God does not want the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood in Israel, to judge the holiness or the unholiness, the wickedness or the sinfulness of the people and have their judgment impaired because they've been consuming alcohol. So they are not allowed to do it in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 5 through 6, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 5 through 6, God gave no grape juice to Israel, nor did they have any intoxicating drink when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. God prohibited and did not give them any alcoholic beverages or allow them to consume them while they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 5 through 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 33, intoxicating wine is likened to the poison of serpents and the venom of asps. That's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 33. Those of you that are in Judges chapter 13, verses 4, 7, and 14, you'll recall that Samson took a Nazarite vow. And in taking the Nazarite vow, he was prohibited from drinking what? Alcohol, again, that was Judges 13, verse 4, verse 7, verse 14. Okay? Come to 1 Samuel 25. There's a real winner of a guy in 1 Samuel 25 named Nabal. Okay? Not a great guy. Nabal dies in this passage as a result of a drunken stupor. 1 Samuel 25, verse 32. 1 Samuel 25, verse 32. And David said unto Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to me, and blessed be thy advice. There's a lot of other things happening that we don't have time to get into right now. I'm just, after the, the part of the story here that relates to alcohol, drop down to verse 35. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he had a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, and he was very, what? Drunken. Wherefore, when she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light, and it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, 
his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about 10 days after that that the Lord smote Nabal that he what? Nabal's all messed up and can't process what's going on because he's what? He's drunk. In 1 Kings 16, if you're writing things down, 1 Kings 16, verses 8 through 10, the king was drinking himself into drunkenness when he was assassinated. And most notably, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 13, David deceives Uriah by, to cover up his sin with Bathsheba by getting Uriah what? Drunk. So there's, there are plenty of passages in the scripture about this. Now, let's go to Proverbs, though, because Proverbs has the most to say. So I've tried to have a combo there of going, turning to some passages and giving you some other things to look at. Come over to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. <clears throat> now for me, when I read what the, the totality <coughs> of what the scriptures say about alcohol, it is something that you need to take seriously for its ability to mess you up. Okay? Now we'll look at a few other things here in a minute, but look at Proverbs 4, <coughs> verse 17. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of what? Violence. Go to Proverbs 21. We're just going to run verses in Proverbs about alcohol. This is probably the most famous one. Proverbs 21, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever deceived thereby is not what? Does alcohol have the ability to deceive you? It has the ability to deceive you, to make you think you're in control when you are what? Not. Read the verse. Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not what? So does wine, does alcohol have the ability to deceive you, according to the Word of God? Okay? Go to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, look at verse 19. Verse 19, hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of what? Flesh. So to, it's kind of like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 about not company with a drunkard. Chapter 23, verse 21. Chapter 23, verse 21. A few verses later. For the drunkard and the glutton, we've already read this, shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Look at Proverbs 23. Look at verse 31. Look not thou unto the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it, when it moveth itself aright. Look at verse 32. And the last, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. The statement in verse 32 about it biting like a serpent and stinging like an adder, the antecedent to that is wine in verse 31. Okay? So what is it that stings like an adder and bites like a serpent in verse 32? It's wine from verse 31. Alcoholic drinks bite like a serpent and sting like an adder, according to the author of Proverbs. Verse 33, hold thine, uh, thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Why do I have that verse in here? Verse 34, be thou, uh, yea, thou shalt be as thou lieth down in the midst of the sea, and he that lieth upon the uh, top of a mast, they have, they, uh, they have stricken me, shall say, I was not sick. So I'm not sure why I wrote those ones down. I apologize for that. Go to chapter 31. What's that, Ernie? I, th 
I think it's part of the, 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 the context. Go, go over to chapter 31, though. Those verses there are talking about the effects of the alcohol that we just read at the end of chapter 23. Chapter 31, look at chapter 31, verse 4. It is not for kings, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for the kings to drink wine, nor for the princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of who? The afflicted. So kings and princes, again, the, the, the problem is that the alcohol impairs the what? The judgment. Verse 6, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open, open thy mouth for the dumb in cause of all such appointed to destruction. So strong drink can be given to those who are about to perish, those who are in pain. Now, do we have better anesthetics now? Yeah, we do, but that was a use of alcohol. Write down Daniel 5, chapter 4. Drinking wine was used in the worship of false gods in Babylon, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 4. So we have a lot of different things going on here, okay? Now... All the things that we've read so far, I would submit to you that they are very negative in their assessment of alcohol and wine and its effects on a person, and they're very negative about the issue of drunkenness, okay? But if we're going to be fair, the Bible does say some other things and appears to, at some cases, at least in, in one with Paul for medicinal reasons, say that you should take wine for your stomach's sake, Paul tells Timothy. We'll look at that in a second. Now look it. I read a book once called The History of the World in Six Glasses. The History of the World in Six Glasses. The first glass, I'm, I'm going to try to get this right because I'm going totally from memory. I should have looked it up and put it in the notes, but I forgot to. Okay? The first glass was honeymead. Now you say, why would that be? Well, think about this. If you have water and you do not handle it properly, can the water go bad and get infected with bacteria and disease and kill you? Is it true to some degree that when you ferment something, it serves to distill out the bacteria and the bad stuff that is in the liquid? Thereby, in many cases in the ancient world, making it safer to what? Consume. To consume. Okay? That's a fact. So if you look at the history of the world, I think the history of the world in six classes was the first class was honeymead. The second glass was tea. The third glass was coffee. The fourth or the fifth glass was like rum and hard liquor, which obviously the Bible is against. And then there was the last one, I'm, I'm forgetting one, but then the, the one in the modern era was Coca-Cola. So the, the, the premise of the book was the history of the world in six glasses, right? Now, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because you could argue, I think correctly, that there was a time where it might have been somewhat dangerous to consume a beverage that had not been to some degree fermented because we did not as humans understand issues related to sanitation and bacteria and germs and those kinds of things like we do now, right? Now we know, even uh, now we know about these things in ways that we didn't know before, right? Now that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm giving a carte blanche approval, if you will, to just the overconsumption of alcohol because obviously it's the Bible against that. But there are some other statements. Go to, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I, uh, um, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes is, is believed to have been written by Solomon. Okay? Notice what he says. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18. But that which... Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor. 
that he taketh unto the Son all the days of his life, which God giveth him for his what? Portion. Look at verse 15. Should have read 15 first, but verse 15. Um, I'm sorry, it's chapter 8, verse 15. Go to chapter 8. I can't read my notes. Chapter 8, verse 15. Here he says, Then I commanded mirth, because a man hath a better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for they shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. Okay? Now, I do not perceive to Solomon here to be giving people carte blanche to go get intoxicated. He's acknowledging, though, that under the sun, as a human being, is there something to be said for eating and drinking and, 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 and having pleasure with your family and acknowledging the fruit of your labor and doing those kinds of things? Okay, look at chapter 9, verse 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God, for God, now accepteth thy works. Okay? So there's a statement where Solomon says to drink your wine with what? So is the Bible totally against the idea of consuming wine in moderation? Doesn't appear to be. Doesn't appear to be. In the book of John, what is the first recorded miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ? He turns the water into what? Wine, okay? So we won't turn there. You know the story, but do turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. Verse 23, Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, drink no longer what? Water, but use a little wine for thy stomach stake and thine oft what? So there seems to be, in some cases, therefore a medicinal benefit to what? To having a bit of wine. At least that's what Paul's saying. Now, if, if I, if, if, the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy to have a little wine for his stomach's sake, then does Paul think that having a little wine is wrong? No. Does Paul think having a lot of bit of wine to the part where you're uh, drunk in excess, does he think that is not appropriate? Does he think it is not appropriate to be a drunkard? Okay. So go back to Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible seems to me then is not against the consumption of wine slash alcohol, period, but it is clearly against the issue of drunkenness. It is clearly against the issue of drunkenness. So it is totally against, like, frat parties, where all people want to do is just see how fast they can get what? Drunk and neighborated and wasted and what stupid things somebody can do, okay? It is clearly against that. Look at the verse, chapter 5, verse 18 of Ephesians. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with what? The Spirit. The Bible is, you could not make an argument that the Bible is against alcohol carte blanche, but does the Bible warn over and over and over again of the dangers of the overconsumption of alcohol, and does it clearly say that believers should not be intoxicated? Okay. So the Bible is not against the consumption of wine slash alcohol, period, but is clearly against drunkenness and intoxication. The believer, look at the verse, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is what? The problem with you being drunk with wine, wherein is excess as a believer, is that your faculties are now no longer under your control. And as a believer, you should be known by the standard of moderation and have the ability to be in control over yourself. Because you are responsible for who? For yourself and for your own actions and for your own attitudes. I have in my notes here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, that one should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That is not simply talking about sexual immorality. It's talking about you as a believer being a, uh, that, that, that you are not your own, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. And as a believer, are you the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
okay? So we should not be, as believers, engaging in alcohol to the point of intoxication. And I will also say this. This is not me telling you that you should have wine, okay? That don't, I'm saying to you that the Bible leaves it to your discretion with the clear prohibition that you should not be drunk as a believer. But you know yourself, and I know people that are almost alcoholic from the moment they take their first sip. It has that much of a power over them. So this is not something that you want to play around with as a member of the body of Christ. The leadership, go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, the leadership of the local church is explicitly, when Paul lays out what you should be looking for for somebody to be an elder or a deacon in a local church, it's somebody who's not, who's not given to much wine. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 3. Well, verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to what? He cannot be given to wine. Because if he's given to wine, the wine is controlling him, and he's not going to be issuing good judgment, good thinking, good teaching, good study habits, because he's going to be too influenced by what? Wine. Look at verse 8, talking about the deacon. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much what? Wine. Go to, first, go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to what? Wine. No striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. What's the next one? Sober, holy, sober, just, holy, temperate. What about the rest of the saints in the assembly? Go to chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be what? Sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. Verse 3, that the aged women likewise, that they be in good behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to what? Much wine. Drunkenness is not solely a male problem. It's a male-female problem. Anyone can end up a drunkard. And it's going to look different in different people. So come back to Galatians chapter 5. I think the best advice, the best advice would be to just not dabble in something that has the ability to have this kind of power over you. Okay? That would, be the, that would be the soundest advice. You know, I, deal with, I see these kids all the time that, you know, now you, you guys are aware of the fact that now that marijuana has been legalized in the state of Michigan, now it's all this synthetic marijuana that they're vaping. And it's 100 times worse than the marijuana that you, some of you grew up with, okay? Because it's more potent. And the way it's delivered, it delivers more of an effect, Okay, now why am I bringing this up? Because I, I, you know, when you're a young, dumb teenage kid or a kid in your 20s, you think you have control over things. And you think you can, you think you can mess around with stuff and it's not going to affect you because, you know, you're, you're, you're able to handle it and this and that, right? The point is, don't, you, wouldn't, you would not willfully go and play in a pit of cobras. You wouldn't tell your kids to go play in traffic. So there's an element to this where, yes, the Bible does seem to allow for people to consume alcohol if it is done in moderation and it is not done to the excess. But the Bible is also clear that is there a major ability for that to mess your life up? So now it is going to be up to you to prove all things and decide for yourself Knowing, though, that God's word is very clear about the issue of drunkenness. So look at verse 25, look at verse 21. 
So we've said a lot about it, but I want you to think about a few things as we close. Verse 21, envyings, murderers, drunkenness. Now these are all, if you go back up to verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. One of them is what? So drunkenness is a work of the flesh. Okay? So if you need alcohol to cope in your life, if you need alcohol to have fun, if you can't have fun without alcohol, if you can't cope without alcohol, etc., would that is a work of the flesh because what you are doing is you are replacing the sufficiency of Christ with a substitute that you think is going to meet your needs. That is not going to work. That is just going to get you deeper and deeper and deeper into something that is not good for you. Okay? So if you need alcohol to cope with life, if you need alcohol to have fun, if you need alcohol to fit in, if you need alcohol to, if you can't, Go a day at work without coming home to calm your nerves or to fall asleep or whatever it is without consuming it, that's a pretty good chance then that you probably have an issue here. Okay? So like I said at the beginning, I don't know where everybody's at, but don't get mad at me, please, for just saying what the Word of God says. All right? So the best advice would be, in my opinion, to just stay away from it. If you're, if you're wanting to have some, you need to have it in moderation. And for sure, as sure as you're sitting in that seat, being drunk is not an appropriate behavior for a member of the body of Christ. And you need to be honest with yourself and say, why am I doing this? And if you're doing it because you're coping or acceptance or some other reason... You're allowing something else to have the place of Christ in your life. And your sufficiency and your acceptance is not being found in him and in him alone, and you're looking for a substitute to get your needs met. And that, by definition, of everything we've looked at in the whole list is a work of what? The flesh. And the other thing I just want to say, and we read the verse earlier, alcohol is a liar. It's a liar. I've seen it with members of my own family. My sister almost died earlier this year. Her liver wasn't working. She was on the transplant list. She's now sober, and her liver has repaired itself. She's actually off the transplant list now. Okay? So I've seen this even in my own family. Alcohol is a liar. It impairs your ability to make judgments about others and yourself. Okay? And it will control you run you, and ruin you if you let it. And it will cause you to engage in greater and greater and greater sin, as we've seen from the verses, okay? So if you can enjoy it in moderation and have control over yourself, more power to you. But the best way is to just not touch it, in my opinion, from the Word of God. Now, I will tell you that I occasionally have a glass of wine, just being honest. Occasionally, like three times a year, occasionally. But I, I, don't, I don't do beer or hard liquor or anything like that because I've seen what it does to people. And I don't, I just, and the other thing is, it's like not appealing to me. Like, you're going to drink so much you puke and do it on purpose? Like, that doesn't sound fun. That sounds miserable. Okay? Anyway. But, lest you think I'm on a soapbox, I guarantee you that some of the other things in this list are things that I deal with. But this one I don't because I've said no to it card blanc pretty much. But just be careful and be honest with yourself. Evaluate yourself on the basis of the scripture and what God says. But drunkenness is 
a work of the flesh, and if you need it to cope with life, to find acceptance, to get through, to live another day, if you're living just for the weekend so that you can get drunk, et cetera, et cetera, those are clear signs of the work of the flesh. Lord, thanks for this day. Thanks for this time. Pray that we'll have clarity on this issue. Um, that we'll be stewards of the Word of God. That we'll let your Word be the authority, not our opinions, not our feelings, not what peer pressure might say or anything else, but what the Word of God clearly says. We ask these things in Christ's name.